Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today we have uh, Sharon Elrich from the Wounds, Wound, Cl Wound Healing Clinic. Is that right? I'll make sure I'm saying that. And she is our stroke coordinator, and she and uh, um, has put together this program about stroke, and because we are stroke certified, is that correct? That's correct. Um, and so it's very important, I think, not only for those of us that know some things, but also people that may not know everything there is to know about stroke. So I think she's going to give us some really good information we can use. Um, just a quick thing, I think November 9th is the next wellness fair if you guys need to come and get your wellness stuff done. Um, you can always go and get your labs done anytime between now and December uh, 15th. I have to think about what date it is. And uh, you have till the end of the year to get all your paperwork in and get all your requirements done. But uh, if you have questions, let me know. But just look online on the internet on the flu shot clinics. Those are always the wellness clinics as well. So if you're looking for a time. All right, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Sharon. And if you join me in welcoming her um, to talk about stroke. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. Um, as Christy said, we became a primary stroke center um, late March of this year. Uh, the reason that we did that, there were several reasons, um, and I'll explain a little bit more about what a stroke center means a little bit later. But um, one of the things that we need to do as a stroke center is do some public education. So you guys are kind of my first, well, second group to, um, for me to learn to take this kind of on the road. Uh, as you can see by the first uh, slide there, stroke really is a brain attack. And one of the things that we are trying to educate the public on is to treat it pretty much like an, an MI. You know, we've got people knowing if they have chest pain, get to the emergency department. Um, one of the things that saddens me is that there is medication that can be given for a stroke to um, decrease the overall effects of that um, stroke, but people don't get to the hospital soon enough to get it. So that's why we're kind of taking our show on the road. Our objectives today are to define a stroke uh, brain attack, identify the two types of stroke, uh, learn what your risk factors are or what the risk factors are for a stroke, uh, learn a few ways to decrease those risk factors, how to act fast, and again, we'll get to that in a little bit. And there are a few subtle differences between, between men and women in their stroke symptoms and risks. So we're going to start out today with a little test. Um, go ahead and read the, what is a stroke. And then please use, everybody should have a um, turning point response thing. If you don't, please let me know and we'll get you one. Daddy needs one. And before we go any further, I do need to thank Carla Wickman from Two South because she um, developed a lot of this as one of her school projects. So, you know, I hate reinventing the wheel. So we just um, have used this program actually in quite a few different places and will continue to. Everybody, looks like we've got 18 responses. And the correct answer is decreased blood flow to the brain. And everybody got that right. That's great. That's good to know. Um, next question is, what are the two different types of strokes? <clears throat> okay, it looks like I think we've got 19 people here. It is ischemic and hemorrhagic, and 85% um, had that right. Okay, hopefully by the time we're done here, we'll, everybody will know the correct answer. What are your risk factors for stroke? Hundred percent of you answered that correctly, and that is A. Your high blood pressure, stress, smoking, and high cholesterol. Good job. What would you do if someone you know is having a stroke or stroke symptoms? All right. Yay! Of course, I kind of gave that one away, but <laughs> good, because actually a lot of people, um, I did a survey out um, with uh, the Senior Expo, 
and a lot of people would call their doctor first, which is sad. Like I said, we need to get people to learn to get to the hospital and call 911. And then what are the differences in stroke related between, between men and women? All right. Oh, good. You guys knew that one. Most of you. The stroke symptoms definitely are different in women than in men. Okay, like I said, a stroke is a brain attack. It can happen to anyone, anywhere, at any time. In fact, babies in utero can have strokes. Um, I've not, uh, Christy had mentioned that she had, had cared for um, a child who had had a stroke in utero. Um, children can have strokes. The youngest stroke patient I've seen is 18. Um, and like I said earlier, the biggest barrier to getting people to get treatment is um, that they don't recognize this, the symptoms or bystanders don't recognize the symptoms and they don't call 911. They may think the symptoms are gonna go away. And like I said, the earlier you recognize a stroke, um, you can get treatment quick, more quickly. It is the fourth leading cause of death, and actually I'm excited about this because it used to be the third leading cause of death, so I think some of what we're doing has improved that. Um, 133,000 people in the United States die. Uh, as you may have received the email from me yesterday, yesterday was World Stroke Day, and every, like it's every two seconds somebody is having a stroke. Um, one in six people, I think, worldwide die of a stroke. The saddest thing also is that those people that are having strokes are generally of lower economic um, status, and so they don't have the means to care for them even after they have the stroke. You know, the cost of debility alone is unbelievable, both from, both from lost, lost productivity, I think I'm having a stroke, I always do this, um, and the cost of caring for them either in the hospital or rehab or even in nursing homes. Um, and the, the thing that strikes me also is that two million brain cells die every minute during a stroke. And in an hour, you lose 3.6 years off your brain life if you don't get that stroke treated. So um, again, anybody you know has those stroke symptoms, call 911 and get to the emergency department. There's about seven million stroke survivors in the US. About 795,000 occur in the United States every year. In the United States, one every 40 seconds. In the United States, a person dies every four minutes from a stroke. So like I said, a stroke is a brain attack. For some reason, and there's a couple different causes, the blood flow and the oxygen to the brain is cut off. Um, and so it can either be blocked by a clot or it can rupture, and that's what we call a hemorrhagic stroke. So then the blood is not, or the brain is not getting enough blood and oxygen, and therefore um, brain cells die. We call there's there's a term for that called the penumbra, which once you've got that clot, it's like almost like a cone shape in the brain that you no longer have function from. This is just a picture of what an ischemic stroke would look like. You know, you think of a heart attack as ischemia. Again, this is a brain attack. The arteries are blocked, usually by plaque or by a clot that moves from <clears throat> another part of the body, generally the heart, sometimes from a leg, somebody who's got um, what we call a deep vein thrombosis when they have a blood clot in their leg. The majority of the strokes, 87%, are ischemic or cut off of that blood supply. Some things that you can control to prevent um, having a, an ischemic stroke is keep your blood pressure under control. That's a huge thing because that's the high blood pressure is putting stress on the arteries in your body, causing that plaque to form because there's enough stress on there, um, just like in a heart attack. Atrial fibrillation is a big one. A lot of our older adults are in atrial fibrillation. And what happens with that is the top part of the heart doesn't beat effectively, kind of just sits there in spasms, and the blood then kind of pools in that atria and can form a clot. That clot can break off, go and go to the brain, can go to the heart. Um, most of these patients should be on some type of blood thinners, generally Coumadin. 
There are some newer medications out there, Pradaxa, um, even an aspirin and Plavix. Sometimes, you know, depends on the fall risk. There are reasons not to take Coumadin. And so the physicians generally have to kind of weigh the, the cost benefit of that. High cholesterol builds up that plaque in those arteries. Diabetes causes that plaque to build up, makes the arteries harder. Um, working in the wound clinic, a lot of our diabetics have very poor circulation to their feet. They have the same problem to their brain, to their heart, all over, which then is basically the atherosclerosis. And then other types of circulation problems. 20% um, of us have a tiny little hole in our heart. You know, when you're born, you have that hole in your heart. 20% of us, that foramen ovale is what we call it, that does not close. A lot of times we don't discover that till a person comes in with the stroke symptoms. Um, part of the workup that we do for our stroke patients generally is at least an echocardiogram. Sometimes they do the um, transesophageal echo where they kind of, to me it's like they swallow a little pill and can get right close to the heart and can see that atria and see if there is that hole there. We also look at the carotid arteries um, if a patient is admitted with a stroke. There are some things that a um, person's lifestyle can be changed so that they can prevent their risk for stroke. The big one is the tobacco use and smoking. And it's not just smoking, actually chewing tobacco also causes the vasoconstriction, the same types of problems that smoking does. Alcohol use, um, again, makes those arteries, makes, just makes your, um, it's not good for any part of your body, really. Small amounts are okay. Don't take my red wine away once in a while, but, um, but constant alcohol use does cause a lot of issues. Also physical inactivity. You know, I'm, I'm probably not the best representation. I know I need to get out there and exercise more. And one of the things that I've seen a lot now is it doesn't have to be a half hour a day. Even 10 minutes, three times a day is just as effective as doing that half hour, 45 minutes. I mean, it's recommended we get 150 minutes per week and it can be broken up into 10 minutes you know take the stairs instead of the elevator any activity is better than none and then um, obesity now, that's a huge problem in our country today in our state you know we've become very very good at eating fast food um, getting our high cholesterol fast food that way um, but I know we're you know there are a lot of programs in place in the schools in particular to um, hopefully decrease that obesity and change children's lifestyles as well. Talk a little bit now about the hemorrhagic stroke, which is a bleeding into the brain. That blood vessel may break, there may be a weakening, there may be usually high blood pressure um, can cause that, and the blood leaks into the brain tissue, thereby blocking the um, oxygen and blood supply to the brain itself. 13% of the strokes are hemorrhagic. These are the ones, though, that are really more deadly. 30% of them are hem of the um, stroke deaths are from a hemorrhage. Here again, know what your risk factors may be for this. High blood pressure is huge. Take your blood pressure medication. I mean, again, working in the wound healing clinic, how many times our patients come in, they're supposed to be on their blood pressure medication or their Lasix. Or, or another diuretic, they don't want to take it because that makes them have to go to the bathroom. So, and they don't want to have to do that while they're out and about. So they'll come in with their blood pressure out of control. Um, the recommendations are now that somebody be on a type of blood pressure medication if the blood pressure is more than 135 over 85. Um, one of the things that I've handed out for you is um, a thing, something you can take with you to take a look at your own risk factors. You know, know what your blood pressure is. Again, the excessive alcohol and drug abuse um, causes, you know, increases in your blood pressure, especially some of the um, bloods, or excuse me, some of the drugs. The other thing that I have seen is um, if you are an atrial fib or on Coumadin for another reason, know what your levels are. Um, have the ProTime INR checked. And what a lot of people don't know, and we try and catch, especially in the wound healing clinic, is that if you're on an antibiotic and taking that Coumadin, that can really change what your INR levels are. Uh, most of the area clinics have a pro-time clinic where the nurses just do a, just a little um, blood draw and you can have it done without even needing to see a physician or anything, and, and nurses are managing those pro-times. 
<clears throat> Generally, your risk period, whether it's hemorrhagic or um, ischemic stroke, one out of five people who've had a stroke will have another one within five years. So again, if you have had a stroke, and I'm, I'm speaking to some of our nurses who work on um, some of our medical units too, that's why we tell our patients, if you've had a previous stroke, you are at, another, at higher risk for having another one. Family history is huge too, that if you've got somebody in your family who's had a stroke, um, more and more research is showing that you're more apt to have a stroke. 40% of people who've had a TIA, which uh, we call mini strokes, or a transient ischemic attack, where they may have the symptoms for an hour or two and they go away, 40% of those people later on will go on to have a stroke. They are lucky enough to have a warning sign, you know, that maybe there's something in their life they can change so that they don't go on to have a full-blown stroke. And like I said, some of the controllable factors that we have, keep your blood pressure, know if you're in atrial fib, Get your cholesterol levels down. Um, manage your diabetes. That's huge. Um, again, working in the wound healing clinic, we rarely have a patient come in with a normal blood sugar. And I realize what we're doing there is a spot check, but um, you know, take your medications if, you're, if you are, diabetes, are diabetic. Know your risks. Some things that you really can't control, age, Older people generally have, are more apt to have a stroke. Can't change whether you're male or female. Females actually um, have a one in five risk of having a stroke, whereas men are one in six. Family history, like I said, the previous stroke or TIA. Um, I've only found a little bit of information about this one, but there's apparently some disorder called fibromuscular dysplasia where the arteries narrow because there's fibrous um, tissue growing within um, their arteries. And then like I talked about the patent for Amino Valley or that little hole in your heart. The symptoms of a stroke, we kind of call these the suddens. Sudden numbness or weakness of any part of your body, the face, arm, or leg. Again, especially one side. Uh, sudden confusion, problem speaking or understanding. Sudden trouble seeing. Uh, trouble walking any kind of dizziness, loss of balance, or incoordination. That's especially the, more the back part of the brain or the posterior portion of the brain. Um, a sudden severe headache with no known cause. The worst headache in your life can mean that you've had a hemorrhagic stroke. Some of the, and, and here's where women differ a little bit. They may have sudden face or limb pain, sudden hiccups, sudden onset of nausea, Sudden general weakness, sudden chest pain, sudden shortness of breath, or sudden palpa palpitations. So again, the symptoms aren't always the same for everybody. And I think that's what frustrates me a little bit too, that it may take us a day or two to even decide, determine that a patient has had a stroke. Especially when they're just having problems walking or they're, they have nausea and vomiting. I know a couple patients, their only symptom was nausea. And finally um, did an MRI and found the stroke on the MRI. Generally, when a patient comes in with symptoms of a stroke, we'll do a CAT scan immediately. Um, we have a three-hour window of opportunity to give the clot-busting medication, which is known as TPA or Alteplase. Um, we want to have that stroke uh, defined within an hour of them arriving at the hospital. So one of the things that we, I as a stroke coordinator look at and what the emergency physicians are looking at is what was the time that patient was last known well? You know, what time they, you know, they maybe talked to their daughter an hour before um, they were down or they know what TV show was on if they happened to be with a spouse. So a little bit more about women, 100,000 women under the age of 65 will have a stroke. Tell your, care, tell your primary care physician if you're on birth control and you do smoke. Um, I, you know, I'm sure people don't want to tell their physician that they are smoking, but that physician needs to know if you do smoke, then they may not put you on birth control pills. Um, I know we've had at least one or two cases where, uh, for sure two, where the woman smoked and was on birth control pills. It increases your risk tremendously for a stroke. Uh, a couple other things, here I go, I'm getting ahead of myself again. If you have migraines, 
that can um, be a risk factor for having a stroke. As I said, the birth control pills or um, hormone replacement therapy for menopause. Diabetes and lupus also puts you at risk and some clotting disorders. Um, there is one for sure. There are several tests that they can do to see if you have a family predisposition um, to clotting disorders. I personally have for sure three brothers and a father who've had um, blood clots and um, I haven't been tested but I did have one of my children tested just to make sure that it was safe to put her on some medications. So um, you know, know your family history even of clots even if it's not a stroke um, that have brought them into the hospital. Hopefully everybody grabbed one of the magnets and if you didn't please feel free to take take one, take extras for your family members. Um, I talked earlier about recognizing the signs of a stroke and what the American Stroke Association and um, a lot of the organizations that talk about stroke use is the acronym FAST, which stands for face, arms, speech, and time. Easiest way to do, uh, to assess the person's face is to have them smile. Does one side of the face droop? And I think that picture is a prime example of what, what a person could look like with that facial droop. Um, ask the person to raise both arms, basically like you're holding out a pizza. If one of them drifts down, then you've got um, some problems there. And then the other thing is speech. Ask them to say a sentence. Um, you can't teach an old dog new tricks or it's sunny outside or it's always sunny in Cincinnati is one of them um, that I've also read. Is the speech slurred? Can they even speak to you? Can they even understand what you're asking them to do? And again, I can't emphasize enough, call 911 or here in the hospital call an ACT team. We have a stroke code um, that the ACT team knows to um, get started. Because like I said, we've got basically a three to four hour window to get that stroke treated. Um, we've had multiple patients who've gotten to the hospital fast enough who have walked out of here with no deficits if they receive that medication. And, you know, I can't say it enough. Here are some ideas. Seven steps to prevent the stroke. Know what your blood pressure is. Know if you have atrial fibrillation. If you smoke, stop. Drink alcohol only in moderation. Know what your cholesterol is. Um, control your diabetes. Eat a healthy, balanced diet and exercise. Now we'll talk a little bit about what a primary stroke center is. Um, Primary stroke centers are hospitals that have been identified by either the Joint Commission or DNV as providing excellence in stroke care. Um, one of the things that was the impetus for Mary Greeley to become a primary stroke center is that um, the EMS law, laws, I know they're not laws, but their recommendations changed that um, smaller hospitals could be bypassed to get stroke patients to a primary stroke center because we've got the equipment and the specialized care to um, provide the best care for that patient who's having a stroke. And actually, they are just in the process of um, developing comprehensive stroke centers. We will not become one because we don't have interventional radiology. But you actually can go to Des Moines and Iowa City are the two places right now that have this where they can actually go up into the brain and take a pigtail and get that clot out of the brain. And if they can't do that, they can put the TPA right up to the area where the clot is. So um, again, remember that's another option. <clears throat> I've got listed, and they're in your handouts there too, of the stroke centers in Iowa. They're pretty much spread throughout, you know, the little bit larger hospitals throughout the, the state. Um, so if you've got family members who live elsewhere, you know, let them know where the closest primary stroke center is. Um, most of the Mercy hospitals are. So I think I got done a little fast. I knew it would <laughs> depend on how fast I talk, but I'll be happy to answer questions and, and talk a little bit more about some of your risk factors. Know what your risk factors are. Know what your numbers are. Um, know how to act fast. Know how to act, you know, if, if you're with a family member or at church or, in fact, I had um, one of the GI nurses mentioned to me that um, a lady from her church actually had a stroke at church. And it made her think of me because she, you know, she knew what symptoms to recognize. 
and call 911, whether it's on your cell phone, whether it's here at the hospital, call an ACT team. Um, the big thing is recognize and call. And again, you, can, you may save a life. It may be your own. Could be a loved one or a stranger. Actually, some, some of the primary stroke centers have done um, public education. I think it was Ankeny a couple years ago had a lady actually have a stroke at Walmart. And they looked at their whole system. They looked at whether the people at Walmart recognized that the person was in trouble, whether they called 911, um, you know, where they would take the, where the Ankeny um, Fire and Rescue would take the client. So uh, we've talked about doing that here. Um, maybe, maybe come May, which is usually Stroke Awareness Month. And just a little inspiration that, remember, life is all about choices. The choices that you can make as far as your diet, as far as exercise. Um, we do have the power to choose, and hopefully we'll all make a wise decision. Um, got a few more, got a few websites that are available there. Um, I also handed out as a takeaway for you some recipes. I looked at some that maybe were a little bit more ready for fall. There are, it's basically a heart healthy diet. Um, one of the best websites I've found as far as if you're looking for recipes is eatingwell.com. It's probably one of my favorites. I think that was the one um, that they had all of the nutrition information on. I know some people here are working with Weight Watchers and all of your carbs and calories and fat content, et cetera, are on that one. So I apologize for not having that up here, but eatingwell.com or just Google Eating Well and they've got a plethora of recipes for you. Couple other things to think about. Here's your stroke scorecard, which I handed out. You, you have a copy of your own stroke scorecard. You know, feel free to take it home. Use that for yourself. Use it for family members, parents. Kind of know what your risks are. Talk with your physician next time you see him or her. Any questions for me? Yes. Who? Okay. Do you know if there's been research done to show if these people who have TIAs and are on aspirin therapy, if their risk is still at 40% that go on to have a stroke, or have they studied that? They probably have, and I may not. I, I could do some research for you and let you know. I know a lot of times uh, I've noticed most of the patients that I see that have had a TIA have been on like 81 milligrams of aspirin, and they'll put that up to 325 or they'll add Plavix depending on, you know, if they found the reason for the TIA. But I, 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 that's a very good question. I can't say that I have the answer to that, but definitely can, can do a little bit of research with that. Um, the other thing that I didn't think to bring up, but that they have now finally added, the American Heart Association um, has added, if the patient has had a stroke in the past, that puts them at higher risk for heart disease. It was always, you know, we always had it the other way around. If you had heart disease, you are at a high risk for stroke, but they are now realizing how much the two go hand in hand. You know, it, it's the same artery, it, you know, the same things that cause the heart attack are causing the brain attack. Yes, Christy. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Then we'll get you Terry, you had one? Yeah, um, we're listed as a stroke center here at Mary Greeley. What exactly does that mean? I, it's probably been in the gram and I just kind of can't remember what, what it all involves. Okay, that's fine. Um, what it involves, it, it, it's a lot, it, it's actually a lot of things. What we had to do to get it um, is we had to prove that I as a stroke coordinator and a physician have had to have eight hours of education on stroke. Anybody who may see a patient has had to have four hours of education on stroke care. I know you guys, like, I know your health information management, you haven't. but. Um, that just means that we have been recognized for excellence, that other hospitals should be sending their patients here for stroke care. Um, we have been getting a lot more referrals like from Marshalltown, um, Fort Dodge, because we have the neurologists, we have the specialized care um, as far as the education of the patients, as far as being able to give the TPA. Mm -hmm. um, as far, and the other things that we've had to do is provide public education um, I collect all kinds of data, and I, I apologize, I should have had that up there. There are eight things that we need to meet as far as being a stroke center. Um, that includes the patient's discharge with the appropriate education, um, that they are discharged on an aspirin, 
that they receive aspirin within two days of admission or a, thromb a thrombo, I, I get my two, thrombolytic is breaks up the clot, um, it, the aspirin or the Plavix to prevent further clots from forming. Um, that, I got, I'm going off the top of my head. Um, we have to do the education, I said. Um, we, it, we're not evaluated on this, but one of the other things we do is that the nurses make sure that they can swallow appropriately. Um, one of the things that can happen with a stroke is that you, you lose your ability to swallow. Therefore, you can possibly develop a pneumonia. Um, there's a statin. Yeah, there's a statin. Thank you. Um, that, that we check what their lipid profile is, and if they need it, that they're put on a, a statin medication to lower their cholesterol. Um, that they're evaluated for rehab. You guys, <laughs> I know, Deb's helped me. I, I should have written all these down. It's most, and then that they're given TPA if they're appropriate. You know, if they're given the TPA if they get here in time. And we really do a good job of that, like in the emergency department, right. Right, it's, it's a lot of that type of thing. It's a lot of data collection on my, um, on my part, that they have a CT within a certain amount of time, um, that we do the v, what they call the VTE prophylaxis, that they're either wearing SCDs or that they get Lovenox um, within two days to prevent further clots and further complications. Um, so it's, it, it's a, like for me, it's a lot of data collection. It's a lot of getting after the nurses on the floor. Anita can attest to that. <laughs> you know, making sure you're documenting all of that. Um, we have all learned how to do, there's a National Institute of Health stroke scale. It kind of gives a number to the deficits that a patient may have when they come in. Um, I monitor that. Um, yes, Cindy. Regimen to determine ischemic versus hemorrhagic. The first thing on we do admission. on admission, we do a head CT, a uh, and and generally, a an ischemic stroke if it's early will not even show up on the head CT yet. A hemorrhage will, and so obviously you won't give somebody a clot buster if they're bleeding. Um, so that's one of the first things. I mean, our goal is to have that head CT done and read within 45 minutes. We have what we call the golden hour to be able to give the TPA. Um, we'll later on probably do an MRI to determine that. And then, then we go on to determine the source of the clot if it is an ischemic stroke. So that's why we'll do, we'll do an echo or a TEE or both. We will do carotid, um, and a carotid ultrasound to see if the, there's a problem in the carotids. I mean, we've done, um, we've got Dr. Dittani who actually does the intervention then, sometimes right away, not always right away to open up those clogged um, carotid arteries. Um, we will do, see, you know, we generally will do a, um, on admission, they'll get a CBC, a CMP, an INR for sure. The other thing we do right away is a blood sugar because a blood sugar high, high or low can mimic a stroke also. So, you know, we've, we've got order sets that the physicians use to, you know, we'll check a lipid profile. Um, if they're diabetic, hopefully they'll do an A1C to see where we are as far as um, keeping the blood sugar control. Sharon, I know there had been some talk about the neurologist being able to um, look at a scan remote from a remote area. From, oh, from a, uh -huh. Is that a capability we have now with the stroke center? Or, um, we, or don't, no? we, we, we don't, yeah, we, the, the, Fort Dodge used to be a primary stroke center, but they lost their medical director. They don't have a neurologist, so they're sending a lot of patients here. We have an agreement that they can look at scans that are done there. Um, there is the capability um, through computer, computers and um, webcams that the neurologist could actually do an assessment, like in a remote hospital. The cost is prohibitive at this point. Um, they do it a lot in a lot, um, other remote states. I know North Carolina. South Carolina, one of those two states, has, has like a hub hospital and then you'll have your spokes that, that you will um, do the assessment. We do a lot more, a lot of the hospitals will give the TPA and then send the patient here. Um, do a drip and ship because, you know, they, they may be McFarland hospitals or they'll say the, the radiologist has read it and our neurologist will say go ahead and give the TPA and send them. Um, but we don't quite have that capability yet. There's a lot of companies out there trying to sell it to me, that's for sure. <laughs> Yes, Roxanne. What about the Factor V Leiden? Are we testing for that on people? We don't routinely, no. But on, in younger people, I mean, it's not a routine test that we do like on every stroke patient. 
but on those that we that are younger in particular it's the Leiden factor that's what I was talking about with the whole battery of tests um, in fact like I said my like I said I had my one daughter tested for several of those and that was one of them that they had that t tested her for um, and if there's you know there's cancers that can cause some clotting clotting difficulties and other things but it's not a routine part of our tests at this point Yes, Christy. I was just going to yes. ask a real quick question. Um, when you talk about migraines as being one of the um, risk factors, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm one that suffers from that. Yeah. And I mean, they'll get bad migraines, but how do I? You, you know what? And you don't. You can't always differentiate. It's one that doesn't. I would say it would be one that wouldn't go away. Okay. You know that okay. with your routine, if you have a migraine and it, and what you usually do to get rid of it does not work, I would be going. Be going. Yeah, I know. Yes, sir. That's related to what I was going to ask, but how long has Mary Greeley been a stroke center? We have been a stroke center for, well, since the end of March, oh. so just, okay. just a few months, not, not real long. I have a friend that, I'm just guessing now, it's probably 20 years ago, had severe headache, was sent, brought to, to ER. Mm -hmm. They told him he just had a severe migraine and sent him home. A few hours later, he was brought back, and it was too late. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that can that's unfortunate, and I, I think we're a little bit more aware of it now, especially being a primary stroke center, um, to not not ignore those symptoms, and, and it is difficult. In fact, you know, sometimes a migraine can mimic a stroke. In, you know, that one side of the body may be affected, and um, it's difficult. But at the same time, I, I belong to several listservs, and one of the person on the persons on the listserv said that if you're not, I'm trying to word this correctly, um, if you're not treating or if you're not looking at patients who aren't stroke, I, I'm not going to be able to say this correctly. But in other words, there are 30% that really are not strokes that we are being that should be admitted to worked up to be worked up for stroke. We may find out that 30% are another diagnosis. Um, but either way, we still should be admitting and working them up and treating them as though they are a stroke. I know that didn't come out correctly. Yes, sir. Well, this, I, I've had migraines since I'm 16 years old. I'm 75 now, and I still have them <laughs> <laughs> occasionally. Uh -huh. But how, how does one know whether that's an yeah, indication? You really, you, you probably really can't. Um, and it, I think it's more in women, too, that, the, that if they've had a history of migraines, um, that they are, and I would say it probably is more of a bleed, but I don't know the answer to that. I'm, I, I unfortunately don't have the answers to everything, but um, again, if it's one that doesn't go away with what you usually do to get rid of it, you know, whether you use your Imitrex or whatever, other medications are out there. If, if nothing will take care of it, I would get to the emergency department. What happens if a person is given TPA who hasn't had a stroke? Generally, nothing. Um, it, you'd rather treat and you'd rather give it um, if they haven't had a stroke. There is a risk of bleeding, but it's no more of a risk. I, I think it's like a 6% of bleeding. The other thing is the medication is out of your system so fast. It's got a half-life of about five minutes. And so, it, um, so it, it, it's okay to treat. It's okay to treat without a stroke. Because there are a lot of emergency department physicians who are afraid of um, being sued. And um, there have been some emergency, emergency department physicians who have talked out against giving TPA. And, they, and some of the emergency docs um, believe that rather than what the um, research has shown. But actually, things are turning a little bit. Our public is more educated, and more emergency department physicians now are being sued for not treating than if they had treated inappropriately. So that's a very good question. The thing is, we pretty much treat anybody who um, uh, comes in and meets the criteria. There are some criteria that uh, if they're on Coumadin and their INR is higher than a certain number, they cannot be given it. If they've had recent surgery, they can't be given it or recent, recent trauma of some type. Um, platelet count has to be within a certain, you know, we've got a whole list of things that they have to meet as well. Um, but the big thing is th they can, it really can't be given any more than four and a half hours after the onset of symptoms. And sometimes it's difficult to determine, you know, 
when that onset was, especially if they wake up with the symptoms. Some places will treat even if they wake up with the symptoms, but generally our physicians don't. And here at Mary Greeley, it's actually the neurologist deciding. They may not see the patient, but the emergency department doc will call the neurologist and ask whether they should give it or not. And with EPIC and with PAC systems and everything, our ER doc or our neurologist can take, see the x-rays at home. They'll look at the CT scans at home. And what's really f fun for me now is a lot of them copy the um, picture of the stroke or the area that the stroke is affected into their, their notes so you can actually see that CT scan, which is kind of fun. Not for the patient, maybe, but for me. Yes, Cindy. Um, the lay public and the media, you know, there have been some recent instances. I, Rosie O'Donnell is one that comes to mind. And it seems like the lay media is suggesting to the overall population that um, one should go ahead and take an aspirin or a baby aspirin. Can you speak to that? Um, Do you have symptoms? I, I disagree with that because you don't know if it's a bleed until you've got that head skin. And, and if you're taking aspirin, it could make that bleed worse. You might be one of that. You might be one of that 13 um, percent, and and that was one of the other questions that we had asked the public too. Would you take an aspirin, or do you think it's no? I I would recommend getting to the emergency department. Um, some of our ER docs, after they've got that CAT scan, will give them aspirin in the emergency department. Um, but I would not, without knowing what you're doing, take Chicken take an aspirin. Close to it. I, I, exactly. If you're close to, mm -hmm. don't take it. Mm -hmm. Yes, wake up with that severe headache and that's what you use aspirin. <laughs> well, I, and that's okay. I, I understand that. I, if that's yeah. what you do for generally your migraine, yeah. I would still take it. I know. Well, let's just say these are really good. <laughs> <sighs> I'm going to get weird here, but my husband called me one day and didn't know where he was. And he was driving. And I told him to just stop it, come and go and get aspirin. I'm treating a heart attack. You never know how you're going to panic. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. called the uh, um, first nurse and she said, no, yeah. <laughs> call, him back call him back and say no. Yeah. And he didn't, but you don't realize the panic you go in. I know. Because yeah. he didn't know where he was. He was trying to find me. And yeah. in the end, we're lucky. They treated him as, for dehydration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, So th those factors, I mean, because everything that you were saying here, I'm yeah. like, yeah, but I couldn't see him. He was in a car. Yes. I didn't know if his face was drooping. Right. I couldn't ask him about his arms, but I'm glad I have this. Yes. Well, and, and you, Deb, know. you know, take more. You never know. Give it to your parents. Give it, yeah. you know, I've... <laughs> is he okay? He is okay. Yeah. You know, and... and we were arguing about the ER bill, and I'm like, oh, that no. is nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Just so you know, our livelihood depends on his brain. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a brain attack. Get to the ER. Stop and call 911. You know, and that's the thing. It can happen anytime, anywhere. And it may not be a stroke, but you want to treat it like it is. Yeah, we, so that you can, we did go to ER. That was the first thing she said was go to ER. Yeah. Him and get get to him to ER. ER. Yeah. He was yeah. at the come and go in Ellsworth. <laughs> <laughs> he was on the highway. He did not have a clue. Yeah, yeah, and that can he happen. He said people were honking at him because he, I think he had that blurred vision thing. Uh -huh. He was like, I was afraid. I was afraid of that I was going to make the wrong decision, and people were honking at me and going around me, and I'm like, great. Great. <laughs> great. Well, <laughs> it, it, you know, pull off. Hopefully somebody will stop. Well, that was what I told him. I said, find a sign, like the little road sign. Tell me what the number is. I'll find you. Yeah. And he said, oh, come and go, because he saw the big come and go sign. I said, go to come and go. Yeah. <laughs> Just go to go come, come and go. go. <laughs> so. And tell him you've got, you know, tell him you need help. And that, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah. That I should probably even talk to the come and goes and some, you know, places like that. Get the magnets out there. The more magnets, the more fast call 911 we can get out there for the public, the better. So, any other questions? These have been very great, so. I won't make you take the post test, because you guys all did so well on the first one. But you know, I, I don't have my number up there. You can usually find me. Kelly knows where I am. You can always call the Moon Clinic. I um, kind of do both jobs. And um, thank you for your attention. Please, if you have any other questions, let me know.